I've never done this before, but um, I actually, you know, my real job is I teach physics at the Lake University. I've been here uh, for 15 years, and um, and when I was invited to do this, I was uh, intrigued, so I agreed. Um, so I should warn you, um, I'm not a film critic. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain uh, the film in any way whatsoever. Uh, but what I will uh, do is uh, is uh, talk about some themes, uh, some physics-related themes that um, that, uh, that inspired me uh, while watching the film. So and don't hesitate to ask questions, by the way. So at least I know this this kind of varies by field, but at least that. Physics, it's common, um, that's our standard procedure to ask questions, uh, you know, so don't uh, hesitate to interrupt. Yes? Can I build one of those boxes? Uh, I don't know how to build one, sorry. <laughs> Down, 
and basically you have to make, generate electromagnetic force acting in the opposite direction of equal strength, and then you have to stack along the same, right? And this kind of thing is certainly possible. I mean, you can buy, you know, things like this on the web, you know, for thirty or forty dollars, something like that, right? Um, and uh, but actually, there are uh, there are, you know real applications. And so the main one in terms of technology are so-called maglev trains. So this is uh, magnetic levitation. And so the basic idea there is you have a strong magnetic field that uh, lifts the train up above the tracks. And so this way you don't have to fight, um, you don't have to expend energy fighting against the force of friction between the train and the tracks, right? So the, the only energy you need to supply is supply the energy of the train going against the air resistance. Okay, that's, you know, that. Um, these things are quite expensive. Uh, but they're actually used uh, you know, today for real uh, commercial applications in Japan as well as in China. So this is a real trading that kind of runs on a daily basis in Shanghai. And they can reach up to something like 270 miles per hour, I think, in normal usage. So, so this, this part actually is kind of uh, realistic. charges from 
positive to negative, and flip everything from left to right, then all the laws of the universe will still look the same. Okay, so that's actually a theorem, uh, a deep theorem in quantum field theory, which we believe to be exactly true, right? So, um, so for the most part, um, as a good approximation, you know, the laws of, uh, of uh, the universe, you know, look the same forward and backwards. So, so we have this, you know, video, um, just two billiard balls colliding, right? And, you know, so just uh, the usual laws of uh, conservation of energy and momentum. And then I just take the same video and I just run it backwards, right? Because in the computer I can do that, right? And so it's running backwards, and they collide, and more or less it look, everything looks okay, right? Now there's some, uh, you know, maybe not exactly. So what, so what does not look okay when you reverse it? Yes. Well, the direction changes, right? So there's so there's a little problem, which is that if you look at this figure here, uh, if you look at this one, uh, the billiard balls are actually slowing down a little bit, right? Because uh, because some of the energy is going into friction, it's being converted into heat. Uh, in this one on the right, the billiard balls are actually speeding up a little bit, right? So they're somehow gaining energy from heat, which is not allowed according to the laws of thermodynamics, right? Okay, so, um, so that kind of gives us maybe a little bit of an insight as to, uh, you know, as to what happens in you when you reverse time. So let's look at it more closely. Um, so the arrow of time. So uh, we take a jigsaw puzzle, and uh, and here I have uh, I have two pictures. They're supposed to be the same jigsaw puzzle, right? These are just two, you know, two arrangements of the pieces, right? And uh, and obviously this one is a disordered one. This is an ordered one. And then I can ask the question: So which of these is more likely? If I just randomly throw down the pieces, which arrangement is more likely? The one on the left or the one on the right? Okay. So this is kind of a trick question, actually, right? Because uh, because these two specific configurations are equally likely, right? Just like I have a deck of cards, right? There are many, many ways I can order a deck of cards. Actually, it's 52 factorial. Each of the 52 factorial combinations has the same probability, 1 divided by 52 factorial, right? So the same way, any arrangement of the puzzle pieces has the same probability. However, there's only one arrangement where the pieces are all connected and in place, and there are lots and lots of arrangements where they're disordered, right? So if I just randomly place the pieces, since there are many more disordered configurations, the configurations that this, that's disordered is much more likely than an ordered one. Okay, so that turns out to be a really important point, okay? And uh, so uh, Ludwig Boltzmann in the 19th century, you know, actually sort of mathematically was able to relate the principles of thermodynamics to this idea of counting states. And his idea was um, that increase of entropy, increase of disorder could be understood just in terms of there being more disordered configurations of any possible systems. So if you start in an ordered state, you're likely to flow to a disordered state. If you start in a disordered state, you're likely to stay in a, more, in a disordered state, right? There's all, all, always, of course, a small probability that um, you start out, for example, in this particular configuration, and you randomly move the pieces around, and somehow you end up in this configuration. But the likelihood is going to be matched. Right, so that's basically uh, basically how probability works in physics. Right, so that um, so now is there another kind of an example of this? If uh, so, we take um, this is just a picture. Of it. It's a video from MIT. What they're actually doing here is shattering a glass uh, using sound waves at just the right frequency. Okay, but the important thing here is that the glass shatters. Okay. Here we have it uh, just going in the reverse direction, right? So you have a bunch of uh, glass fragments, right, that are you know colliding together uh, to form a glass, right? So when we look at this video, we know uh, something is going wrong, right? But uh, but actually, you know, if you think about it, there's nothing really wrong from the perspective of the laws of physics. If you were actually able to take all those fragments and launch them with exactly the right initial positions and the initial velocities so that they 
come together to form a whole glass, you know, everything works. Everything is consistent with the laws of mechanics. It's just that there happens to be only one configuration of the pieces which forms a whole glass, and lots of lots of configurations where you have a bunch of random fragments lying around everywhere. And it's extremely unlikely that if you choose a configuration of random fragments and you run it either forwards or backwards in time, that you will get a whole glass, right? So it's not really about um, you know about uh, the direction of time. It's really just about probability. Okay. Um, okay. Sadly, by the way, Boltzmann, you know, um, had a lot of arguments with his colleagues, you know, trying to reconcile, you know, this idea of randomness and determinism in physics. Uh, he actually ended up committing suicide. So, uh, but so, so, but coming out of this, um, you have the idea that a, uh, despite the fact that the laws of physics are invariant under time reversal, um, a universe that starts in an unusually ordered state will have a definite direction of time, right? So, um, so we have the symmetry of time reversal, uh, but now if you start with a universe that's very ordered, um, it's generally going to go to a state that's more disordered, and so you'll have a definite arrow of time then. Right? Now, of course, you might say, well, if a universe started in a disordered state, then it would stay disordered, and there would be no arrow of time. Right? So that suggests there's something uh, possibly very special about our universe. If you want to ask me, why is our universe such, um, you know, that the initial state has a lot of order? I have absolutely no idea, okay? But what I can tell you is that if we did not happen to live in such a universe, then none of us would be here, right? And basically, you know, the universe would consist from the very beginning of a bunch of molecules just moving around randomly, and they would continue moving around randomly forever, right? So it's the fact that somehow we started in a very, very special, uh, very non-random state, uh, that allows all of us to exist and also allows us to have this era of time. It allows us to experience uh, this idea of causation, where we think of the past influencing the future rather than the future uh, influencing the past, right? And again, it's, it's not because there's anything magical about, about the directionality, it's just that the past is more ordered the future is more disordered, it sort of makes sense to think about a whole glass being the cause and then the broken glass being the effect rather than vice versa. Okay? Um, and, and the same reason, uh, you know, something like memory can exist, right? So we can remember the past, I mean, basically because the past is simpler than the future, right? Because again, there's only one version of the complete puzzle and uh, many, many versions of the disordered puzzle, right? So if you were uh, looking at, uh, if you started with a disordered configuration, you could imagine working backwards what the ordered one must have looked like, but you cannot go in the other direction. So we can't remember the future. Okay? It's just too hard. Okay. All right, so that's kind of uh, the background of the era of time. So I'll just say a few words about time travel. Okay, so this is just a picture, I think this is from Wikipedia, what a causal loop is. So again, we have these billiards, okay, and so this billiard ball is moving, it's being struck by another billiard ball, it gets deflected, it goes into this time machine, right, uh, because it's just the right angle to enter into this time machine that follows this loop, and then of course that billiard ball turns out to be the ball that, you know, it hits, that practically hits. Uh, the first ball causing it to go into a loop in the first place, right? So, that, so you have this self-consistent uh, loop happening, right? And this is a picture, you know, somebody has put together um, uh, on how things work um, in the primary, right? When uh, A getting into the box, you know, getting to the hill, you know, checking the stocks, getting into the box, getting in the box for six hours, and then, you know, A, uh, the second A, so, uh, so that's kind of the general uh, picture now. So you might ask, do these things really exist? Well, the answer is yes and no. So, well, 
The answer is no. Okay. Uh, but uh, at least in principle, so if you look at general relativity, right, um, which is sort of our theory of how we're, our best understanding of how the universe is structured, uh, in principle, the equations of general relativity allow time like um, closed curves, which is basically a curve where you're going forward in time and going forward and forward and forward and forward and coming back to where you started. Okay? So it's kind of weird, but it's, in principle, it's possible, just like, for example, space can be closed instead of space being a flat piece of paper. You can imagine space being, you know, a sphere or a cylinder or something like that, right? Or if you go in one direction far enough, you come back to where you started. At least in principle, time can be like that as well. And there are at least some natural solutions of the equation can satisfy that, so that's been known Know, for uh, at least eight decades. It's been explored by many. I mentioned Frank Tipler, that he happens to be a faculty member of Tulane, and he studied something called the Tipler cylinder. It's basically a very massive, infinitely long cylinder. It's rotating, and, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's generating fields that basically cause uh, these time-like uh, paths uh, to exist. A few you know, practical issues, again, has to be infinite long for the equations to work. Uh, also, one can show that if you actually try to construct a finite version of such an object, uh, we need to have uh, regions of negative energy density. We don't know how to do that. Okay, so a few, you know, technical issues there, right? So we need a little more fun, right? Um, and there are many other solutions, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm collecting donations as well, by the way. And there are many other solutions. And more recently, people have been interested in worm, so-called wormholes. And the basic idea is to have kind of a relatively flat region of space-time here, and another one here. And then they're connected by this wormhole. And you say they go through this flat region, and then go through the wormhole, and again, come back to, um, to where you started. So at least in principle, these things are, are uh, allowed. Um, now, sort of, one might ask, well, what are the constraints of these? Um, so, uh, a Russian physicist uh, named Igor Novikov started thinking about this, I think, sometime in the 1970s, 1980s. And uh, the principle he came up with was uh, the so-called sum consistency principle. It means when you go around the time loop, um, you know, everything has to stay consistent, right? Okay. And so you kind of uh, saw an allusion to that in the movie where they were, you know, trying you know, to stay in this hotel room, be isolated, so they're not changing, kind of changing the history, right, of, uh, of the world, right? And that's kind of the principle. But the idea of the principle is that uh, this should hold, and it's an actual physics principle, this should hold whether they're trying to or not, right? So whatever they try to do is necessarily by the laws of physics consistent with what's going to happen after and with what's going to happen before, okay? So, um, so this doesn't allow for changing your history, right? So for example, no matter how you try, you're not going to be able to go back and kill your grandfather before you're born because that would be inconsistent with your future, right? Okay, uh, so generally I would say uh, physicists, you know, to be believe that if, uh, you know, it's a big if, if, uh, um, you know, these closed time loops exist, if time travel exists, it should satisfy this condition because we can believe the universe should be consistent, right? Again, someone should be able to look at the universe from the outside and be able to say at any given instant in time, this is what happens, okay? However, um, so one might ask, is there a way to kind of get around this idea and uh, maybe quantum mechanics? provides a way. And so this, uh, so let me just give you a kind of a three minute introduction to quantum mechanics, and, I'll, and then I'll stop. Um, so, uh, so like classical mechanics where things are, you know, uh, are not definite, right? Any classical physics, including general relativity, at any given instance of time and any location in space, something is either happening or it's not happening. Uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, by its very nature, the science allows for superposition of alternatives that are classically mutually exclusive. So, for example, where classically uh, a particle can be pointing up or down, quantum mechanic 
they can be a superposition of upper and down. But again, more interestingly, um, uh, Schrodinger in uh, the 1930s, uh, you know, famous um, uh, uh, quantum physicist, came up with this um, kind of uh, example, um, uh, which involves a cat in a box, okay, Schrodinger's cat. And the way it works is as follows. You have a nucleus in the box, which has some probability of decay, let's say a probability of one half of decay, right? And so if you're a physicist, uh, you would say that, you know, if, 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 if the nucleus is in a closed box, it can be, uh, it can decay or not decay, but actually, I, if you don't open the box, it can be a, in a superposition of having decay or not. Okay? Just, just have to accept that that's the world, the way the world is. Okay? Uh, but now, uh, in the same box, you attach, so you attach this device with a hammer, and so if the nucleus decays, the hammer drops, the hammer uh, breaks this vial of poison, and then there's a cat in the box, and then the cat dies. Okay? If uh, the nucleus doesn't decay, then of course the hammer doesn't drop, and then this happens, and the cat, the cat is happy and alive. Okay? So now if you take literally the laws of quantum mechanics, apply them to the box, you would say that until somebody opens the box, the cat is in a superposition of being alive and living. Okay? Now, is this true? Well, I can't really say because one can't really do the experiment, right? If you open the box, then of course the cat will be there alive or dead. Okay? However, you know, there are different interpretations um, in, uh, in uh, uh, quantum mechanics, and this sort of gets a little bit more, you know, to the philosophy side because you can't really do an experiment to see which interpretation is right. But uh, so something called the Copenhagen interpretation basically says when a quantum state like the superposition of life and that cat is observed or measured, uh, it collapses. It's like throwing dice, and then it somehow nature chooses one of the alternatives in a way we don't understand. Okay, so it's like the cat comes out to be either alive or dead. Right. So in this interpretation, quantum physics is not determinist. The other interpretation is something called the multiple worlds interpretation. And the idea there is that somehow both possibilities actually happen, and they're both part of the reality of the universe, right? But you can think of them as somehow two realities that are coexisting. Okay? So when uh, before I open the box, the cat is in the superposition state, being alive and dead, right? When I open the box, we get a superposition of me looking at a live cat and me looking at a dead cat, right? And then, you know, so on and so forth, right? And so the idea is that since these two parts of the quantum wave function can't really talk to one another, because a live cat is just way too different from a dead cat, effectively they just act as two different histories of the universe, okay? So um, the way that this kind of connects up with time travel is in principle, if you allow for this different histories interpretation and you allow for these closed timeline loops, you can imagine kind of a scenario where you start in one particular history, you go around the loop, and then you come back into a different history. Okay? So in this kind of scenario, it is possible, at least in theory, um, uh, to kill your grandfather, for example, okay, before you're born, and that just means you would arrive in a different history of the universe, one in which you happen not to exist. And that's, you know, perfectly legitimate, uh, because that particular history has always existed, in fact, it does exist, with some finite non-zero probability. So you can't change the probabilities, but you can kind of jump to one history to another. Okay, so, so this may be getting a little bit weird.
I, um, I, after I, so I was invited to talk about it, I thought it would be a good idea to watch it, so I not to embarrass myself too, won't too much. Um, I think the second time watching it, I understood a little bit more. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's a really fascinating movie, I think. Questions? Yeah, I'm just curious, what was the Hired. 